Welcome back to I'm Still Here. I'm Larry. And I'm Heather. In 1998, at the age of 26, I was diagnosed with stage 4 breast cancer. It changed everything for us, but I'm still here. You are. And we are in the second to last episode of this 5 to Thrive theory. theory <laughs> series. I can't speak. Woo! Um, it's more than a theory, really. It is a theory. <laughs> we believe. <laughs> it's a series, huh? So what have we been through? We have been through three different f- phases. Mm-hmm. of. So we did kind of the diagnosis or pre-diagnosis, and then we did treatment. And now we're talking about kind of post-treatment. Um, and we have been talking about physical, mental, nutrition, medical, and uh, we're going to talk next week about support. So we um, are covering kind of all of the things that we feel like have made a big impact on my, you know, in the time that I've dealt with cancer, right? So. Right. And the, the part that has changed the least in this is the post-treatment because that's what you've been in the longest and have the most experience with. Yes. Today we are talking about the medical side of things. Yes. So I think in some ways people think, oh, it gets easier, right? Like it gets easier to be done with treatment. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about it a little bit, but it it does and it doesn't, right? Because you kind of depend on that, or at least I, I sort of depended on that from a mental standpoint to think about, you know, um, it kind of working for me and, and knocking out cancer all the time. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I think is a big, can be a problem is that metastatic breast cancer is just still so misunderstood, even by people in the medical community in terms of, you know, you'll run into people saying like, oh, so you're in remission or so you're done with treatment or you're all of these things. And it's like, that's not how this works. Right? How does it work? So it worked. I mean, what happens is that you are in, you are doing some sort of treatment for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. likely. There are a few, few outliers mm-hmm. who have stopped treatment and, and have done fine, right? But um, for the most part, you, you don't go into remission necessarily. You are, this is where, like, we're really happy with stable you know that your scans are stable that there hasn't been progression those type of things are the big deal um and it really depends on the the type of cancer we're talking about and where it's metastasized to sure to what those treatments obviously are yeah and and how long and or how uh intense or how often yeah and even just kind of the what the scanning process will look like can will be different you Mm -hmm. know for different metastasis so why don't you go through what you've done post-treatment in terms of what does your medical life look like post-treatment yeah so i mean initially post-treatment i was um put on tamoxifen which is a pill that people you take every day um it's again to like stop hormones i'm not good at any of the technical stuff of that i know a lot of people know it very well um i was on that for a couple of years we would then we would scan i think initially it was every three months and then we went to six months um it was a long time before i went to a year um we can talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But then uh, had a scan that showed a little bit of progression in the bone, like in a bone met. It wasn't big. It wasn't a lot of spots. It just showed that it had changed. And I went on to a different drug called Arumidex. Uh I was on that for, I believe, I don't know if it was a year and a half, something like that. Um and then same type of situation where, again, it wasn't like a freak out, never um, progression anywhere else or other organs, you know, um, but just, uh, okay, we're going to switch again. And at that time, I started Fosladex, which is also called Fulvestrant. Um, and at the time, that was in 2004 when I started that, it was really brand new. In fact, they were um, still doing it yet. At the time, it was one shot, so kind of a half. Now that would be considered a half dose of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have been, the Fazodex is I go into the cancer center locally every four weeks. It's a shot in 
my butt area. Um, it's, you know, it's fine. It's really, can, it's really thick, so it's hard to push. I definitely have developed a ton of scar tissue back there because of it. Um, but in the scheme of things, like, it's really easy. It doesn't, I'm in and out of there in, you know, a few minutes. So, um, we have had some other things that have happened along that time. We, I did start Herceptin in 2008. Again, that was when we thought that there was some progression, but then it actually, we did a full biopsy, like took a piece of that bone and biopsied it, and it wasn't progression. So stayed on the Herceptin for a while, um, and then I ended up stopping that because I was having problems with my heart. My ejection fraction was uh, falling. So, so yeah. Yeah, and... and um... I've kind of held on to one of the things uh, that your oncologist has said to us, and and I don't know the level of truth to this, but I I appreciated it. Is is she said, you know, when we were there was a lot of scans early on that were scary mm -hmm. and a little progression or these kind of things or, mm -hmm. or there's a spot and we're gonna look at that and and those kind of things. And she just said, you know, if it comes back. It's not going to come back in one spot. One spot. Yeah. It's not going to come back in a oh, little progression here. It's going. We're going to know. Yeah. So I've kind of held on to that and 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 have gone through a progression of different medicines through this. And I think you know some of those were side effects. Some of those were just let's try something else uh, or the delivery of. And and I know everybody you know people listening to this are on probably have you know are on some of the medicines that she started with, you know, 20 years ago and still yeah. on that and going strong. And that's awesome. It's just, um, it, yeah, I, it, it is, it is somewhat of a crapshoot still. Yeah, it is. It it's really a is. The it's dice not. to see what you're going to work with your body yeah. and what your body's going to respond to and what your cancer is going to respond to. I feel like um, the knowledge of the science of treating people in treatment after diagnosis of metastatic cancer is much more scientific and there's way more data that they can use by obviously, you know, um, a, a workup on you and then the known um, history of treating patients with, with specific drugs based on you. It, we know, there's so much more we know about that compared to 25 years ago. Whereas post-treatment, there's just not that data yet. Yeah, it's difficult because, I mean, nobody, you know, it's it's to have to maintain, like, actively being on chemo is just so hard on your body, sure. right? Yes. And so that's why, I mean, that's what I know this whole metastatic community is hopeful that we can find these, you know, drugs that will help keep us stable, you know, yeah. no evidence of disease, no evidence of active disease. There's all the acronyms out there. Um, but... In also in a way that our we can still live our lives yes, right and exactly. have a quality of life that is, you know, not super compromised by the treatment mm -hmm. and um, yeah that's always the challenge. Yeah, and there's this balance that that you all deal with of you know even you know get you said you know the drug that you get is you know it's a sh couple of shots and mm -hmm. the behind and you have scar tissue from that. Well, that is a quality of life thing, even that right there, that minor, you call it. Um, it's certainly not something I would want to do or have to do. You know what I mean? It, you minimize it. Well, but it's not a little thing. It's not a little thing, but it's also one of those things that I I know it could be so much worse. Sure. Right? You're so comparing. I, I, I'm comparing it to a huge continuum, mm -hmm. right? I, I also... I, it's one of those things that I do kind of go sometimes if I'm feeling sorry for myself or if I if I'm listening to somebody who seems especially whiny about things I'm like listen mm -hmm. you know jackass yeah, you've like, never been a whiner you you don't have any idea you know what I mean like those are yeah. um and even like with my Fosladex it's just been in the last two years that we reduced it back down to a half a dose. Mm -hmm. And the quality of life with that has been so much better. Mm -hmm. Just because I can rotate the shot 
back and forth and I don't even always rotate it back and forth because one side just handles it better than the other side. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, even that kind of stuff is, is such um, just something that I think that's the other living with cancer like this and and living as long as I have people it's not at the forefront for other people in my life and that's Mm -hmm. okay but occasionally I'm like I don't really care about your hangnail I'm sorry (laughs) it doesn't make me the most I I, you know compassionate person in the world so so obviously we're not going to give you uh the a, a silver bullet if you're looking for that kind of thing because everybody is absolutely different in, yeah. in this post treatment um when it comes to the medicine or yeah. the, the treatment plan yeah. but yeah you know. but you know i mean we've learned a few things about dealing with the medical you know side of things over time you yeah. know um it, just recognizing that scans are very anxiety inducing. Um, we've talked a little bit in the past about scheduling them at a time when you maybe don't have a lot going on either, you know, at work or in your life or holidays or, you know, I don't like to get results around a time that I know it can kind of squash something that I'm really looking forward to. So, um, I think that's important. The other thing is I, I think what I've learned over time too, because when, when you get into the world of cancer, right, like you, it's every three weeks and every this, and it seems like everything has to be exactly on time, right? Mm -hmm. And I know there's some importance to that. But as you get farther out, it's not as imperative that everything go exactly, you know, to the day or whatever. So you, I think what... Well, does does part of that mm -hmm. come in your relationship with Dr. Mariver? Yeah. I mean, just, yeah, I think it comes in... Be able to have honest conversations. Yes, in trusting your doctor and saying... And even, I think, I've, you know, I've met or talked to so many women who've said, like, yeah, I did say to my doctor, I'd like to go on vacation, but... And the doctor said, go, you know? So some of it is you're trying to be a good patient. You don't want anything to, like, screw something Mm -hmm. up, right? But there's there also is this, you know, balance of living your life and, and knowing you know, how to get through those things. So the next thing that I think is really, really challenging, especially early on, is that everything that comes up from a medical standpoint, the first thought is going to be, is this cancer? For example. Oh my gosh. Everything from uh, headaches to back pain to... It, I, literally everything. Mm-hmm. Every ache and pain, every yes. bump or anything like yes. that. The first thought is, is it cancer? Is it cancer? Yeah. And that has gotten better, but it's. But will never go away. It will never go away. No, that's not something that right. for you and for the people listening, and I'm sure they understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Is that'll never be zero. No. Even though 25 years, 24 years ago, it was a. 15 out of 10. Yeah. All right. And it was, oh, S-H-I-T. Yeah. Holy crap. And the world is melting. Yeah. Until we got into the office. Yeah. You know, now it, it's not as one. It's not, it's it's still a eight. It, yeah. It depends you know, on what it is, truth. right? Yeah. It depends on what it is, I would say. It's just not nearly as likely to happen or even like this time of year for me, I tend to get a lot of headaches. I know now that it's related to... Like the weather, the whatever, the mold, all that kind of stuff. It's uh, this is just a time of, and that took my PCP saying to me, um, you know, you've been in here like the last three years at this time of the year. You're like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. you know, let me just. Which is so understandable, though. I I totally get that part. Yeah, it's just human nature. Yeah. So the question is like, how do you balance that mm-hmm. also and figure out? You know, I one thing I had found that I started doing pretty early was like, I, if something felt off to me, I would think about it a little bit and then I would tell you about it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just felt like so many times if I talked to you about it, it would either dissipate. You would have something that would be like, nope, that doesn't make sense. Have you thought of this? Yes. Have you thought of that? You did this the other day. Yes. Something like that. Um, a lot of times just saying your fears out loud kind of helps them go away anyway. Yes. Um, Letting somebody else know. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. And then if it doesn't go away, 
having somebody else to help you monitor it and then make an X plan with an appointment of some kind or or whatever that, that looks like was, mm. you know, has been really helpful. And you certainly don't want to ignore those things. No. You know, you, no. you shouldn't. I, I don't want to say you can't because you can. Right. But you shouldn't. I mean, I, that's that's part of the system is you identifying things early. Yeah. Or and knowing early you your can. body the and best you can. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that stuff is, um, it is a, an ongoing challenge, you know, mm-hmm. to, to manage that kind of thing. So right. um, the other thing would be, like for me, is also now about managing side effects. So, you know, when we started this, and again, things have changed it so much over the course of time. And I just want to address this because I've gotten a couple of um, DMs lately about specific parts of my treatment. If they're not doing my treatment in the United States anymore, <laughs> there's a reason for that. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. I I know that that it's really easy to hook onto one thing and say, well, that's the thing that's going to do it. And if you've got nothing else from this, I hope you understand there wasn't one thing. Right. From from all of these, if you've right. listened all the way through to now, there right. there has not been one. Right. Thing. And I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about like. If you could have been diagnosed now, like mm-hmm. what would be the, the pros to that? And I'm like, let me tell you what the pros. There's mm-hmm. a lot of them, a lot yeah. of them. So, um, I guess with all of that, you know, like now I manage side effects more than anything, mm-hmm. you know, and that is from the drugs that I was on. That at the time we didn't care. We didn't care what long term. We'll take long term side What's effects. What's long term? Like we're not we going to be here for a long term. Right. We didn't know if I had months even. Yeah. So we were like, long term did not matter. Yeah. But now, um, you know. And you have many of them. I don't know if you want to go through kind of a. I mean, you deal with a lot of side effects. Yeah, I do. I mean, the biggest one. Well, there's two I think that are the main ones for me right now, and that is. Uh, the osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is, you know, because I was on Zometa, a bifosphonate for so long, the half-life of those drugs are forever. Um, I got, I, there, I mean, I had a lot of fractures when I was on it. Um, but now the osteonecrosis of the jaw has been going on since like 2013. It has been pretty quiet for the last couple of years. I saw my dentist today and he did the no, same thing. No, that was thing. me. Oh, shh, shh, shh. Sorry. <laughs> he did the same thing. It was like knock on wood um, because we know how quickly the ONJ can move and how destructive it can be, right? So yes. I've lost um, two teeth on my one side. I had a, at one point I had an opening um, in, the t- in the palate my top palate Mm -hmm. and uh i still (laughs) i still sound a little funny when i'm blowing my nose at times because my bottom part of my sinus is a little corroded from all of the the loss of bone so this is all your fault this is ivy for those of you who are listening (laughs) and haven't listened for a long time she was very very loud when we first started doing this i made the mistake of knocking on wood (laughs) don't do that with the dog around so Stop. Okay, you said hi. That's go enough. lay down. Good. Go on. Go lay down. Okay. Um, also, the other side effect I think that's the biggest one for me is the cardiomyopathy. Yeah. So that <clears throat> that is from being on both probably adriamycin with the combination of Herceptin later. So they can both cause heart issues. Um, and I, for me, that <laughs> looks like. Um, being out of breath quite easily mm-hmm. uh, and a high heart rate, you know, without a whole lot of effort. Mm-hmm. You know, the upside to that is that my Apple Watch, like my exercise ring, is completed most days. But uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. the downside to that is it, it is, you know, it does keep me from doing some things and uh, it can be a little challenging. Yeah. So, and I am on a beta blocker for that. Also, so and you have minor, you know, like uh, when it's talking about you know the quality of life, whatever. There are definitely things that you don't will not even try or do anymore because of the possible fractures, you for know, sure, and, and just being easier to do, and you just stay away from those things. And yeah, there's probably a few things you'd like to do that you don't. Um, yeah, I would say there are probably less now that yeah. we're getting older, but yeah. yeah, not just that. I think there's other things. I mean, I I think I do manage probably more aches and pains than 
sure. the normal 50, healthy 51 year old woman does. Mm-hmm. I, you know, even just, you know, my, the fractures in my feet have been so extensive. Like the one, especially, you know, I just feel it. I don't love yeah. to be barefoot, things like that. Yeah. Um, but, but overall, and, and the people listening, you probably have a laundry list of 30 yeah. other things yeah. that you're managing right now. Yeah. And it is a management and, and it's, and it, I would think, because I don't know, I would think at times you have to go, this effing sucks. Yeah. You know, this is yes. just, you know, it's under, and, but then, you know, you, there's the balance between my life sucks with this yeah. or dealing with this versus my life. I'm yeah, alive no. to feel that pain, that <laughs> suck with that, the, the BS. No, uh, I definitely, hard. I definitely feel like that. Like, I'm really yeah. happy that I have the opportunity to even complain about the little things, yeah. right? And they're not um, little things, though. Well, whatever. In, right. In the scheme of mm-hmm. what it could be for me. So, right. um, figuring out how to manage side effects is, you know, I think a challenge. Again, some of that stuff is... Um, you need to advocate for yourself. The ONJ, I, you know, I found one of the top doctors around supposedly. And he, the first guy that I saw completely blew me off and mm-hmm. I knew something was going on, mm-hmm. you know, and just, you have to keep, you have to keep trying and, um, you know, just listening to what's happening to yourself, you know, your body and, and finding people that you want to work with. I mean, yeah. they don't, You know, I guess for me, I feel like I don't compromise in terms of I know that all of the doctors that I work with are highly qualified. They they have specialties in the areas that I, you know, am working with them for. But I also they also are really good humans and they have they care about my listening to you you know about the the hormone imbalance and the the that kind of stuff that or the you know the early menopause and stuff most doctors don't care yeah that's like i fixed your problem you're here (laughs) who cares about a hormone that's messed up or or, or that you the, don't have any libido. Yeah, or libido, that, you, or that kind of stuff. All of those where kind of things, yes. we have an on, or you have an oncologist that, or it's we, yeah, um, that does give a crap and yeah. that will listen and will do research on our behalf and yeah. and that kind of stuff is pretty awesome. But that's finding the right team, in which we've talked about a ton before, right? And yeah, it's getting people that you trust and, and yeah. that care about you for more than just um, I'm going to kill this thing inside of you. It's more than that. yeah. And I was going to talk about that, too. Like, I think there is this management of, like, I have a local PCP who is great. She does care about my whole thing. Mm -hmm. But I honestly, I will say, I feel like I'm telling her things sometimes. Absolutely. There's no way. So my oncologist has really taken on that primary role for me. I, you know, because I of the relationship I have with my PCP, I don't have to bug Dr. Mariver with, like little prescriptions and things like that. But the one really overseeing my care, even 25 years later, is my oncologist because she truly understands all of the interaction, you know, with because of the cancer. I'd be interested to, for other people. I mean, do you, do you, do people have with metastatic cancer, do they have PCPs who truly understand that? Yeah, I don't I know. Think that I would can, be very unlikely. I would think so too. And I just also just. I, we live in a rural area, so PCPs oh, are that, so yeah. busy and oh overworked gosh. here that it's just there's it's just really not even the time yeah. <laughs> for that kind of stuff. Right. But the other thing I would say with that too is you know I have a great team at the University of Michigan, but um, my ONJ doctor is at Mayo, and mm-hmm. they have been fantastic about working together. Mm-hmm. Um, there's doctors that do ONJ at Michigan that didn't work out for me, mm-hmm. you know, so it's okay, you know, especially if you have the resources to to kind of put together that team the way you want it to the be insurance. put together. We, we were blessed with great insurance. Yeah, that help, that's very helpful Lucky. too. So, yeah. Um, so I guess all of with all of this, I think it again comes back to just recognizing that it's not going to be easy. Some days are going to be a lot more challenging than others Mm -hmm. um but um you are your biggest advocate in terms of knowing your body knowing how to respond you know and knowing how to put people around you that can help you 
you know, respond to yeah. the challenges. There's going to be challenges. And some of it is just because metastatic cancer is scary. We know it's scary. And so, you know, you're not going to be on top of it every day. And, and next week, we're going to be wrapping this up, talking about support and yep. the post-treatment support, and we'll get much more into that. Yeah. Yep. So, all right. Let's uh, call it a week. Let's call it a week. <laughs> we'll Perfect see you friends. later. All right. <laughs> see ya.